we'd had very basically zero rates for the past uh, most of the past 20 years so this is kind of a new option that a lot of investors have i can get a risk free rate of four percent i imagine that there's going to be someone out there maybe on the margins who will sell their stocks in apple in other risky products, take that money and put it into a money market fund to get that safe yield. So that would be very negative for risky assets. It's never the blow up, it's the run that kills you. So those outflows, the, the decline in assets are what really cause small wounds to become critical, to become fatal. And so, you know, you're not, you're down, the ultra short bond funds are down 20% over one year. It's like 20% over one year is not gonna kill you. 20% over one month, over one week, is going to kill you. My pleasure to welcome Joseph Wang and Pete Crane. It is Thursday, September 22nd, one day after the Fed's FOMC meeting. Gentlemen, great to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here and great to meet you, Pete. For those of you who don't know, uh, Pete Crane is the founder and publisher of Money Fund Intelligence and the president of Crane Data. So Pete is probably one of the top experts in the field of money markets. His product is used by everyone in the money market space. In fact, I'd say it's the gold standard. So we're very lucky today to have Pete come and uh, discuss with us what's happening in the money market fund world. I can tell you when I was at the Fed, we also used Pete and we read his reports. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really, ple it's a great pleasure to have him here on the show today. You're too kind, Joseph. Yeah, I used to, I joke, uh, like they, like Bill Graham used to say about the Grateful Dead, I'm not the best at what I do. I'm the only one who does what I do. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So Pete, you are an expert in money market funds and Joseph, you too are an expert in money market, money market funds. Cause that's sort of the department that you worked out at the fed. So very rare to have one expert in this niche topic, but two is uh, something that I, I don't know. I, I've, I haven't seen a podcast. So, you know, as, as a podcast, host, I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Um, before we get into money markets, we're recording the day after the Fed FOMC meeting where uh, 75 basis point with, with, uh, interest rates were, were raised by 75 basis points, uh, but then the forward interest rates were raised significantly or the market uh, anticipated basically a hawkish meeting. Uh, risk assets like stocks wavered all over the place. I want to get uh, your t two reactions to it. Joseph, uh, what, 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 what stood out to you? So... I think Powell, I viewed the conference as a continuation of Powell's message since Jackson Hole. Powell was very resolute that the Fed is going to be higher for longer. It's trying to make the market understand that the Fed isn't going to just turn around and start cutting interest rates the moment there's a recession. That, that seems to be what the market perceived, and the Fed is pushing very strongly against that. He did that uh, in two ways, in my view. The first is the dot plot which showed a very notable upward revision in where the Fed, well, FOMC committee members thought uh, that the Fed funds rate would be next year and the year after. And the second thing that stood out to me was that Powell was very, very resolute in trying to communicate that even if we have a recession, he's still going to keep rates higher. And he did that by being very open and telling everyone that, you know, we're going to have some slowing down economic activity and we're going to have higher unemployment. He was willing to accept that. So I think the market got the message. If you look at the two year yield, which is the most sensitive uh, product to to Fed, the, the, the Fed's path of policy, it went up comfortably above 4%. And risk assets also got the memo. Uh, stocks sold off the day of the meeting. And as of today, they seem to continue to sell off. The dollar is also strengthening. Um, so I think Powell did exactly what he wanted to do. And I think he communicated that very clearly. Yeah, the interesting thing is the, the magnitude that they've gone so far. I mean, 175 basis point hike doesn't seem like that much. But looking back the three in a row, it's gotten us up there fast. And five hikes this year at the start of this year, we were basically at zero and now you're over three percent so it's been uh just a study study hike and then as joseph said the the staying up there for a long time or for longer than most expected rates to go up and then to come right back down now they're rethinking that position and of course uh that's good news for 
Yeah, so for basically a decade, we'd had very basically zero interest rates. Or, I mean, the Fed hiked a little bit a few years ago, but they didn't get very far. Now, soon, we're looking at short-term interest rates that uh, in a couple months are expected to be 4% and maybe above. And that's going to fundamentally change a lot of things in the market. And one thing that it would change is a lot of people are probably going to want to know what a money market fund is because suddenly for well, the first time in many many years you're going to get a very good return from a money market fund um, for those who don't know Pete, can you help people understand just what exactly is a money market fund it's not yeah, just for sure. boomers right <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well that the people rediscover it soon right cash is uh has been out of favor for decades the markets have been doing so well and rates have been zero for you know 13 out of the last 17 years roughly so you know money market funds have gained their notoriety as a parking place moving into other assets a lot of the brokerages that are out there use bank deposits and sweeps too so money market funds you know are basically a, a hybrid of a bank savings and checking account they're not FDIC insured they're not bank products their investment products, so you could lose money. We've only seen that happen twice in the 50-year history. Uh, you had the Reserve Fund famously break the buck in 2008 with the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, and then there's been reform since then. So a lot of the the funds today are backed by Treasury bills, and you know they represent an ownership stake. So money funds are basically a little more institutional. So big companies that are well beyond the FDIC insurance limits will use money funds to park their cash in between payrolls and transactions and, and other things. So there's five trillion in them. Today, they, they gained about a trillion in March 2020 with the buildup of cash and bank deposits are 15 trillion. They gained about two trillion back in March 2020. So we're certainly sitting on large levels of cash, uh, but that cash sort of wall of cash that Wall Street strategists are always argues coming into the market. I mean, that's there mainly for transactional purposes. So, uh, yeah, it, that that three percent on fifteen twenty trillion is going to start throwing off a meaningful full amount of interest income. And then you have CDs, you have you know short term bonds and and other you know that aren't really savings products, but that are shorter term, safer things layered on top of that. So. Yeah, no, the uh, the boomers are going to get their revenge with those in interest income statements uh, coming up soon. Yeah, m money market funds, I think their origin was in the 1970s because banks, uh, via regulation, weren't allowed to uh, give give enough money on deposit or charge enough for loans. So it was sort of a way for people to, to get around that. And yeah, so they're on, the, they're on the continuum of cash, and they hold short-term assets like very short-term treasury bills. Um, back in the day, I think there was a you know, big bull market in them owning, owning commercial paper, which is short-term uh, uh, bills, but instead of issued by the government, it's issued by Lehman Brothers. And so uh, you say that, yes, money market, there's only two times it happened uh, in, in 2007, but I just want to be clear that uh, it, it went to $100, it went to $1 to 97 cents on the dollar. It's not like it went to zero. So the worst losses people saw were, were $3, right? Yeah, and just to add on the for those of you who weren't born in the 70s or were too stoned and did, missed it uh, during the time, uh, inflation was in the early 70s. Money funds are turning 50 next month, but you had inflation rates of 15% in the U.S. You had interest rate income or interest rates of 17% peaking out and coming down, and then 78, 79, you peaked out again. So, you know, 8% inflation seems like a shocker, but the U.S. has has seen some higher uh, episodes. Just for review, as Pete mentioned, money market funds are kind of like checking and savings accounts in the sense that when you put $1,000 in, it's always 1000 It doesn't go higher, it doesn't go lower, so it's not like a stock. Now, when you put your money into the money market fund, the fund manager then takes that money and invests it in very short-term liquid instruments and safe instruments. So, since the Fed is hiking rates, the yield on those short-term instruments are also going higher directly as a result of Fed hiking. Right now, money fund yields are, well, I guess Pete will tell us exactly when, how much they're yielding, but soon they're going to be maybe 3 4% or maybe more. And so if you're an investor and you're thinking about what to do with your money, well, you could maybe put money into Apple, 
maybe you'll buy some AMC, maybe you'll buy some call options and, and YOLO it. Or you could take your money and you could put it in a money market fund and get 4% guaranteed risk-free. Well, pretty much risk-free, depending on the type of money fund, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So that that's something that people haven't been able to see for, for a very long time. As Pete mentioned, we'd have very basically zero rates for the past um, most of the past 20 years. So this is kind of a new option that a lot of investors have. I can get a risk-free rate of 4%. I imagine that there's going to be someone out there, maybe on the margins, who will sell their stocks in Apple and other risky products, take that money, and put it into a money market fund to get that safe yield. So that would be very negative for risky assets. However, it, it seems like we haven't seen that yet, which is an interesting question that we should explore. Why is it that even though uh, the Fed has raised rates so much, we actually don't see a lot of inflows in the money market fund space. Their assets continue to be about $5 trillion. And, and sorry, Joseph, that, that is fascinating because during March of 2020, rates collapsed. So you think money, money would flow out of the money market funds, but because of QE, there were so many bank reserves in the system that they actually, those went into... Um, uh, money market funds funds as well, right? Exactly, exactly. And part of it is because of regulatory issues we've discussed before, where the banks basically uh, have too much cash and they want to push some of it out for regulatory reasons to shrink their balance sheet. And money market funds were beneficiaries of that push out of banks and into um, um, basically investment vehicles that were not banks. Yeah, yeah, Pete, can you just give us the data on what money market funds are yielding? Because I know bank deposits have not kept pace with the true interest rates. You know, now the the you know three month Treasury yield is uh, something like you know higher than three percent, but a lot of banks still yield you know one basis point or seventy basis points. So money market funds could be a way for folks to actually keep pace with the true sort of price of money. So yeah, how, how juicy is it in the money market funds now? And what do you see looking forward when you look at like the interest rate curve? Yeah, and I, just to remind listeners, I use the line, uh, Mark Twain, as Mark Twain said about the weather in New England, if you don't like it, wait 15 minutes. <laughs> if you don't like the yield on whatever you're getting, wait a few days because everything's moving. Make sure you're looking at recent data, recent numbers, because as of yesterday, money funds were yielding 2.12% on average. At the start of this year, it was 0.02%. Next week, it's going to be over two and a quarter. And within a couple of weeks, it's going to be 250 to the top funds will be pushing 3%. You'll get a, you know, some of those big Vanguard and Fidelity funds are going to break three within a matter of weeks. And then, as Joseph said, by the end of this year, 4%. Uh, isn't exactly a layup, but it's a it's a short jump shot at this point. So four percent on a T bill, two years may look great now, but if all of a sudden money funds are yielding four percent by the end of this year, you know you're they're going to be in a better spot because keep in mind it, the yield is secondary. It's you're there, you're in cash because you might need the money tomorrow. The liquidity and the convenience is, is king in that space. And so if the market crashes and you wanna buy things, if your brother-in-law gets arrested and you need to bail him out, whatever, whatever, if you need access to your money today or tomorrow, you, know, you don't wanna to have to sell when something's down and you wanna be able to make that transaction soon. So it's not just what the rates are, then if the competition looks worse, if stocks start to suffer volatility and bonds have gotten hammered, the bonds are just you know down 10% roughly on average uh, in, in that space. And so it's not just the positive reinforcement of higher yield, it's the negative reinforcement of, of seeing losses on the other side that's, that's starting to push money that way. Yeah, I want to give a quick shout out to Joseph, who earlier in the year said that he, he could see the, the 10-year Treasury yield hitting 4%, which at the time seemed like, you know, a, a dunking on a 20-foot high basketball hoop. But uh, we're getting pretty close with the 10-year at 3.7%. So, you know, I don't give shout outs for people making right calls often. But uh, yeah, I think, Joseph, you've, you've definitely earned, uh, you've earned a, lot, yeah. a lot of respect with that call. That was out of consensus. I think that was on your show back earlier in the year when I think the ten years below two even. So, well, I'm a, yeah, I, I don't really remember. It was a lot. It was a lot lower than it is today. I still believe we're going to hit four, maybe beyond by the end of the year. Yeah, uh, Pete, I want to ask you what 
about, about the possibility of something breaking. Everyone knows the Fed has made it very clear that the Federal Reserve cares about one and only one thing now, that is inflation. But something could break. The only thing that's going to make them uh, pause and perhaps even cut rates is something breaking. Uh, in 2008, it was the securitization markets and the banking system. In 2019, it was the repo system. Now they have a f facility for that. Uh, what do you think is something that could break and would it in any way relate into the money market fund? And I just want to actually read a quote from uh, something that you said in our pre-interview, which was that, quote, in 2008, it was waves and waves and each one was bigger. So far now, it seems calm, at least on the surface, but there's got to be stress somewhere. What did you mean by that? It's been amazing. There hasn't been a sort of blowback or issue. But as we've seen, when the market moves against you, you know, somebody is no doubt under stress or strain. So, you know, preparing for that, I mean, uh, the Federal Reserve had supported the market in March 2020 and some of the money markets, the commercial paper market froze and they brought in these facilities that they had unveiled in 07, 08. And so those are still sort of there. Uh, money funds are 80% government and investments, treasuries, repo, backed by treasuries, government agencies. So the odds of a credit e event or the size of, of a credit event is going to be smaller. But no, most certainly uh, you're, you could see some of the bond fund space in particular where you're seeing outflows. One of my mantras is it's never the blow up, it's the run that kills you. So I always advise people stay away from that number one ranked anything, that top yield. You know, and as we talked, we touched on the savings accounts, you know, most of them are 0 0.05, but you'll see a Goldman Marcus or Ally, you know, you'll see some at two, two and a half. By next week, they might be three. And it's like, you got to ask yourself if someone's paying 3%, you know, are paying over the market, whatever the market is, you know, why do they need the money that bad? Why are they getting that return? And so it, the, the risk isn't just that they blow up, it, it's that hot money has moved into this space and then all of a sudden it recoils and causes a little problem to get much bigger. So yeah, it, it's, you know, as, as economic conditions suffer strain and stress and credit markets, you know, the volatility we're seeing is no doubt you know, uh, causing stresses, and, and it's been surprising that nothing's, you know, broken yet. But before bringing Joseph in the conversation, I just want to uh, say, Peter, I saw an interview from with you in 2007 where you said the exact same thing. You said if the Fed funds rate is at 5% and a money market fund is giving you 5.4%, watch out because there's they're taking some sort of risk in order to generate that yield. And obviously that turned out to be a good call because you know, one of the money market funds uh, uh, broke, broke the buck uh, where you could, it was, went to 97 cents. You don't want to be in an outlier is the main, the main point. You know? and, and, and what's it, an outlier? Meaning, what, what would, meaning that you know, know? something, if the Fed funds rates at 525, if a bunch of funds are 510 to 530, if something's yielding 6%, you look at that and say, you know, what are they doing? You know, right. They've got to be pushing the envelope. So even three quarters of a percentage point above what the average is, that's it's, a, that's it's a, a huge, warning it's signal a to yarn, you? It's a, it's a major warning signal. I also want to introduce quickly that the money market system now is somewhat safer than in 2008 in terms of the credit quality. The uh, money market funds that are lending to private institutions, commercial paper, is smaller as a percentage of the total money market now uh, than it was before the great financial crisis. And as you said, Peter, 80% of the money market funds uh, uh, own government treasuries. Um, but Joseph, government treasuries are risky. So what, what do you think, you know, the two years moving 10 points a day. So what do you think about something uh, that could break? And yeah. Well, Jack, you're, you're definitely becoming a money market fund expert as well. You know the composition and the history fairly well. Um, so one thing that's really interesting that's happening in the money market fund space is that, as you noted, a lot of money market funds uh, buy U.S. treasuries, mostly treasury bills or uh, coupons that are rolling down, about almost about to uh, be redeemed. But that's what they can buy and have bought in the past. But right now, what they're mostly investing in seems to be the reverse repo facility. And that's a lot safer. So as you mentioned, Jack, when you're, when you're buying, let's say, a one-year bill or something, interest rates can move up or down, and you could have uh, unrealized losses. And that doesn't really look good to your investors. And, of course, you don't really know what the path of interest policy would be. Um, so you might be locking in yields that, that are lower than what 
actually uh, will happen. So one of the one of the things that I think we see in the money market fund data, and, and Peter can speak to this, is that money market funds are staying very very short. So they're basically investing largely overnight and very conservatively in the reverse repo facility, which is basically depositing money at the Fed. Um, I think. Pete, you have a research report out that, that shows that what we see right now in the money market space is basically unprecedented. They're very, very short and very, very concentrated in their investments with the Fed. Yeah, and money funds have been you know, criticized in the past for this maturity transformation is basically they're promising or they're, they're pledging to give overnight liquidity, and yet they're investing you know, what used to be 60 days, 40 days, now it's 18 days is the the average maturity the, what the, what it takes on average for the portfolio to turn over? So you'll see that on the upside with the yield, you know, as you see those yields rise, that it's basically something matures, and over half of money funds, fifty three percent now, is this repo, the vast majority of which matures overnight. So you'll see half of the portfolios will get the higher yield today, you know, because the Fed hiked yesterday, today's the first day you get the higher rates, and tomorrow's the first day we're going to see that, and this being Monday in the uh, broadcast, so you'll be looking back at Friday's data, and we should be already up a bit. Yeah, and I just want to comment that there's sort of a spectrum about how much something is a free market, you know, where let's say in, in crypto, if everyone wants to borrow dollars to buy Bitcoin because everyone's insanely bullish, yields will go to 20%. But now if it's risk off, everyone wants to get deposits and no one wants to borrow money to go long Bitcoin, uh, you know, yields will go to 4%. On the total, the reverse repo facility is the exact opposite thing. It has nothing to do with supply and demand, right? It's just, it yields what the Fed says it yields. Joseph, can you just comment on how big of a change that is where it, back in the day, uh, money m market funds, they used to own treasuries, but now primarily they essentially are using the Fed as a, as a checking account. I mean, that must be a real significant difference. And for folks who look back at history and said, oh, well, actually, this is going to happen because in 2013, XYZ happened, you know, it's, it's a different ballgame, right? So I think there's two reasons for this. One is, as you suggested, Jack, there's a difference in how the Fed conducts monetary policy now. In the past, the Fed conducted monetary policy by uh, basically trying to move the Fed funds rate by adjusting the supply of reserves in the banking system, basically moving the interbank interest rate, the rate that banks charge to borrow from each other overnight. Um, so today, though, it's difficult for the Fed to do that because the level of reserves are so high that banks don't really need to borrow from other banks now to set interest rates. Instead, rates are set by uh, an administrated rate, which, as you noted, is a rate just set by the Fed and that administrative rate that matters most is reverse repo rate, which is the rate that uh, money market funds and some other investors can lend directly to the Fed. The reason being, the logic being that, well, if you can lend to the Fed at say, you know, 3%, there's never any reason for you to lend to anyone else below that. And that's how the Fed sets a floor on, uh, on money market rates right now. Now, the second reason that the Fed has become so much bigger in the space is because uh, there's a lot of money market funds who can only buy safe assets now. And right now, um, you know, there's not that. So right now, the Fed is the best deal in the market. So money markets, generally speaking, there, there are two kinds. There's government money market funds, which can only invest in risk-free assets. And there's prime funds, which can invest in uh, risk, so riskier assets, usually uh, deposits at, at banks. Now, uh, there has been some structural changes in the money market fund world since now that almost all the money market fund assets belong to the government funds. And since government funds can only buy safe assets, and there's not a lot of safe assets to buy, uh, they, it all ends up on the f being invested with the RRP. And so, Pete, uh, that's pretty a big that's a pretty big shift, right? I think remember before. Uh, let's say pre-crisis, you had over maybe a, what did a half trillion dollars in prime fund assets. Today, it's a fraction of that. That that seems to have really yeah. changed the landscape. Yeah, and and there's also other supply sort of tranches that the treasury bills. Uh, you know, or the, the treasury will vary its issuance of bills widely, and so the conservative treasury and government funds, you know, are, are bidding for that. And so yeah, the Fed basically 
you know, had to, to put a floor under the market so it didn't lose control of where the rates were, were going. And then government agencies have been issuing less debt for various reasons, and I don't understand all the U.S. Treasury finances, why they issue so much, but they've been trying to, they have been trying to lengthen that, you know, the maturity, you know, issue longer term stuff that money funds don't buy, and so they can only buy the shorter, less than a year uh, bills, more or less. Exactly. So, yeah, it's it's been a uh, interesting transition, and, and uh, you know the both sides have become a little bit dependent on each other. That the the even the CP and CD debt that the money funds are buying are from giant banks and government agency entities that are sort of swapping on both sides of uh, of these trades. So the the you know the shadow banking system and the normal banking system have become very you know intertwined as any good shadow should be with uh, <laughs> its its master. As Jack mentioned before, one of the mechanisms where we see higher short-term rates impacting the bottom market is when people take money out of the stock market and put it in a money market fund. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so far we haven't seen very large inflows into the money market fund space. Uh, why do you think that is? And do you think uh, finally, eventually after these rate hikes that we'll get more more inflows in, into the money market fund space? Yeah, it's it's a mystery. I, I think we will see them, especially as we get into the fourth quarter here. But that a lot of the money that's, you know, first cash competes with cash, a lot of the stock market dollars, you know, people think everything's a zero-sum game and moving back and forth, but of course money's being created and destroyed all the time. But a lot of the brokerages now sweep to bank deposits. And so if you sell in your Schwab account, it's going to go into a bank deposit. That data is has a lag. You don't see a lot of that until a time later. And you can see a lot of the, the investors that are, you know, getting 0.25% on their brokerage sweep, they're starting to move it into money fund, position money funds and filter it back. But yeah, seasonally, the first three quarters of the year is, is weaker. I think businesses that dominate the uh, institutional money fund space uh, are also spending again. And so the inflation and the return of spending is sucking cash out of the economy in general. And, you know, people like to think, oh, the market's going down, so my cash must be rising. It's like, you know, in the fall, when you get in here, they're all going down because oftentimes people are pulling out money to pay bills, to pay college tuitions, you know, to, to and now they're paying more for everything. So there's just less cash uh, in the kitty. But uh, money funds will, will see assets increase, and they're just below their record levels of, April, May 2020, I I would wager they're going to break through those levels within uh, two months, three months from now. And Joseph, to what degree does quantitative tightening play a role? When there are fewer reserves in the system, does that mean there are fewer reserves to go to money market funds, even though yields are so much higher? Because we saw that in March 2020 when yields collapsed, but deposits in money market funds exploded higher. Do you think we'll continue to sort of see the reverse of that, where uh, rates will go up, but uh, the, the inflows are not there into money market funds. So QT reduces the level of reserves in the financial system. A reserve is a, basically a deposit at the Fed, just like me and you have deposits at a bank. Um, so I would focus more on the other side of that asset. So if a bank has a deposit at the Fed, it's a reserve, but on the liability side, it's a bank deposit usually. So when the Fed is doing QT, it's reducing the level of deposit, level of reserves in the financial system, but also oftentimes a level of deposits. Deposits are what people like you and I think of as money. So there's going to be less cash in the system. And if there's less cash in the system, uh, sometimes that means there's less cash to go into a money market fund. So that's definitely a channel as well. But like Pete mentioned, there money is being created and destroyed all the time right now. Even though we have QT going, we also have the banks creating a lot of credit. Bank credit growth is, is very high. So that creates new deposits, which possibly over time could end up in a money market fund. So it, it's definitely, QT is definitely a headwind, but it's not the only thing uh, to think about. Interesting. Just to, to follow up on that, if I borrow from a bank at, let's say, 7%, why would I put my money in a money market fund that's yielding 2%? It seems like I'm sort of getting negative 5% there. You wouldn't, but let's say you borrowed 
uh, from the bank uh, to buy a house. Okay, oh. then you spend that money. Some that money ends up in someone else's bank account. That that person has a whole bunch of money, doesn't know what to do with it. Maybe he, you know, he puts it in a money market fund. Who then puts it into reverse repo facility and and, and gets uh, you know three four percent soon. So it, money moves around. Hmm. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, and cash is somewhat illusory too that you know we throw these yield numbers around you got to keep in mind you got to be there for a year to earn two or three percent you're getting you know divided by 365 that number daily and people think oh there's this giant pool of cash that's just sitting there but underneath the surface it's churning if you're if you're uh, checking accounts any if you have it jack probably doesn't have one right but uh if you have a checking account and it's like mine it's bouncing all over the place and churning but over time, the balance, the aggregate balances look smooth, but a dollar that's, you know, they're in money markets, you know, by the end of the year, almost none of the dollars are the same dollars that started the year because they've been out and in and out and in and out and in. And, and so over time, that's why the yields matter. But, you know, you're if you're using it for transactional purposes, it's the size of money you're talking about the time you're going to have it sitting there. And if you're going to, you know, if you if it's long term, stay long term. I always joke, don't time the money markets either. The other markets, you really want to, you know, if, if, if you might need the money, you got to keep it close to cash or in cash. If you have time, you know, you got to ride out these waves and storms. But uh, just keep that in mind that these rates are annualized and they're, you know, you got to be there a while to earn them. So Pete, from your research, who tends to be the investors in money market funds? Are they mostly yeah, I mean, retail it's, or it's, who else? It's 30% retail, 7% institutional. So any institutions with money, with payrolls, with, you know, and those tend to be with the 250,000 FDIC insurance limit, you know, the bigger companies, it's like, you know, the banking system's uh, safe. But if you're, if you're trading blocks of hundreds of millions of dollars, it reverses where you're risking uh, something if you have it at one institution, whereas the money fund's diversified, has a bunch of different uh, institutions represented underneath with their debt. So, but there's all, all kinds of investors, all kinds of entities. Um, it's, uh, you know, the Fortune 500 financial firms um, down to, you know, it's 57 million money market accounts. The bank deposit number is a little bit bigger than that, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it represents, uh, you know, a cross section of almost every institution in the country. So basically, if you're like a company, so you wouldn't put all your cash in a bank because, as you mentioned, a bank de a account at a bank is only insured up to two hundred fifty thousand. Let's say you have a billion dollars. Well, if the bank has some kind of trouble, you're going to lose a lot of money because only two hundred fifty thousand out of that one billion is guaranteed. But if you put it into a government money market fund, even though it's not insured, you know that the money market fund only invests in very safe assets, in this case, oftentimes reverse repo facility. So it's basically risk-free too. So you, it's a safe way for someone who has a lot of money, like an institutional investor, to, 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 um, to place their money. And it's cash-like and yeah, liquid. And that's, yeah. and, and that's one of, the, one of the paradoxes of investing is sort of the, the, the more money you have, the wealthier you are, the more risk you can take and the less risk you're actually taking because you're diversified, you don't have to pull the money, you can ride out these storms. And so the, the giant companies with $100 billion, the Googles and Apples and Berkshire Hathaways, you know, they're not just in, they're investing in money funds, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff underneath. But they can afford, you know, they can afford to take those risks. They can afford to to wait for maturity. And in the money markets, it's it's very rare that somebody defaults. That Lehman Brothers, when it went bankrupt, you know, went from roughly triple A, double A, just the highest rating, to bankrupt to default over a weekend. It's like that's happened. Like I joke, that's happened like three times in the history of the world. Uh, for a. Uh, uh, disintegration that quickly in most cases the money markets would let it roll off they'd you know they it matures and you're out uh, so if you're only invested for a week a month even a year you know the odds of going from investment grade down to something more dangerous are, are very thin but certainly uh, we've seen it happen in the past Joseph if quantitative tightening occurs well it is occurring if 
a lot of the assets that are not being bought back by quantitative tightening are, uh, let's say, non-coupon securities, very short-term securities that then can be bought by mon money market funds. Uh, would that result in uh, the people using the reverse repo less? And also, to what degree would that be a soft QT where, you know, a hundred trillion, excuse me, a hundred billion dollars could be rolling off, or more likely $70 billion could be rolling off, but so much of that is, is absorbed by the, you know, over $2 trillion in the reverse repo facility. So to what degree could that be a stabilization uh, to the market that, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that people aren't taking into account when they hear like, oh, $95 billion worth of QT? So like you suggested, QT increases the amount of treasuries the market has to absorb. Um, but what kind of treasuries really depends on how the U.S. Treasury issues. So going forward, if the, the U.S. Treasury could issue more Treasury bills to and then take that money to pay back the Fed, if the U.S. Treasury uh, works with the Fed to conduct QT that way, then that's going to be very, very smooth because, as you noted, there's $2 trillion sitting in the RRP. And as Pete noted, there's not a lot of bills right now in the markets. So going forward, if the U.S. Treasury decides to issue a lot of Treasury bills, that will increase the supply of Treasuries. And somewhere, 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 maybe a money market fund will take money out of the reverse repo facility and use that to invest in Treasury bills. Um, in that sense, I think um, it's really fairly painless for, for QT from a QT standpoint because that cash sitting in the RRP was really not not doing anything anyway. It was basically just excess liquidity in the system. Uh, but so far, it doesn't seem like the Treasury has indicated that it will do that uh, based on their expect based on their forecast they, they seem to not be uh, not significantly raising their bill issuance going forward mm. but isn't that kind of like turning on the humidifier and the dehumidifier at the same time it, like if it isn't the point of quantitative tightening to increase the amount of duration and volatility in the market so that financial assets go down so that people who have financial assets feel less wealthy and are less wealthy so that they spend less money? And wouldn't, you know, a stockpile of $2 trillion uh, cushion, wouldn't that sort of uh, negate the impacts of QT? And is, is that a bad thing for the Federal Reserve if they can't, you know, inject enough volatility into the markets? I think that's an interesting question because let's say, um, uh, so, uh, so, Monetary policy is conducted by the Fed, who tries to control, uh, conduct monetary policy through interest rates. Uh, but the fact is, the U.S. Treasury, who is not in charge of monetary policy, also has a lot of influence on interest rates. For example, it could issue a whole lot of 10-year 10 uh, or 20-year or 30-year treasuries, and that would push interest rates higher because of interest increasing supply. But then that would be monetary policy, in a sense. Now, I think it depends on how closely the Fed and the Treasury coordinate. From my impression, though, is the Treasury is really more interested in other things right now. Uh, it's not really interested in, I guess, making risk assets go down. That's 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 not really their thing. It may be more of a Fed thing. They're more interested in, uh, at the moment, more interested in basically trying to fund the Treasury at the lowest cost on average over time to the taxpayer. And that could be issuing more bills or it could be issuing more coupons, depending on how they evaluate that. So I I don't think the cor the coordination is is as close as to as as to see them work together like that on, on this issue. Pete. Yeah, and they're both uh, the Treasury and the Fed. I mean, kudos they they've been uh, working hard, and they've got a ton to do too because there's a lot of regulatory changes and issues going on these days at the same time, not just with you know, uh, crypto and stable coins and other things, but money market funds are expecting a new round of reforms uh, pro from the SEC any day now, next month and two months or so in Europe, uh, where I'll be next week. Um, they're working on all kinds of reforms. So the financial system's really still, you know, making changes from the last round. And now they're gearing up and bracing for this uh, next current uh, storm that could be happening. So it, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm not saying Joseph wasn't a popular guy before, but uh, <laughs> he, he he should be busy uh, over the next few months. Uh, you, you bring up some really good points. So there's there are big reforms coming out in, in the money market fund world, and I, I would like to talk about them. But before before that, since you mentioned going to Europe, 
one of the things that Crane Theta does better than anyone else is that they have a good insight into the offshore dollar money market fund world. So for those of you who don't know, well, actually uh, everyone who listens to the show knows that there's a huge offshore dollar world. Now, if you have dollars offshore, you also need a place to put them. And sometimes you don't want to put it into a bank, especially uh, if you have a lot of money. So just like investors onshore in the U.S., oftentimes you put it in a money market fund. But those money market funds are domiciled outside of the U.S., so they're not regulated by the SEC. Um, so can, can you give us a sense as to how large these offshore dollar funds are from what you see? And you know, do they behave differently than the onshore money market funds that we have better data on? Yeah, sure. The the we we call offshore the European uh, money fund marketplace is about a trillion and a half, about a trillion dollars of that is mostly domiciled in Dublin and Ireland, uh, and mostly for multinational corporations with European operations. There are some Cayman Islands and Bermuda and Bahamas entities. There are some money funds domiciled in those but they tend to be smaller and not used by the the, the larger blue chip corporation types. But uh, yeah, Europe t- has some of the same issues, but doesn't have the Fed to protect them out over there. So if you look at the US dollar slice of that one and a half trillion is 500, 700 billion is the big piece of the pie. Then you have Euro money funds are about a hundred uh, billion with the US style stable values. Then there's another 400 500 billion that are these standard money funds in france they're more like ultra short bond funds uh, and then you have sterling money funds over there too but they tend to be more credit reliant more cp time deposits uh bank cds and less repo less government debt too so more credit uh focus so yeah they tend to sort of uh, follow the U.S. because it's sa- the same investors but a different domicile. You know, it's these multinationals with their their pull. They'll pull their cash in various uh, jurisdictions and and leave it there depending on the tax uh, issues and stuff. So yeah, I'll be talking about that uh, next week. But it's it's U.S. investors aren't allowed to buy that stuff. So it's you got to be domicile. The U.K. has a lot more lenient. Uh, rules for their individuals to buy all kinds of offshore operations and entities. And, and U.S. investors may be finding a way to do it, but I don't uh, sort of watch or see that stuff. Yeah, so uh, CP is commercial paper, and then CD is certificate of deposit. Pete, so you said that the offshore dollar-denominated uh, money market funds are 500 to $700 billion. And then the U.S. domiciled ones are five trillion. So at least in nominal terms, not including sort of off the books, less official things, but in nominal terms, the U.S. dollar money market funds is something like eight to time eight to ten times bigger than the offshore dollar money market yeah. funds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and in Europe, in Europe too, the the money fund there aren't as much domestic money fund marketplaces, and the banking system still rules in the rest of the world as it, as it still does in the U.S. as well. For now, right. For now. We'll see. Um, <laughs> yes, tell us about this new regulation that's coming in, and, and does it involve something called swing pricing? And what is swing pricing? I don't know what it is. Pete. Yeah, that the SEC proposal that they put one out in December, there were com- a comment period at the end of or mid-April. They stopped taking comment letters, and then there's been a little lobbying behind the scenes. And uh, Gary Gensler at the SEC, you know, his motto has been, get her done he's just you know pumping out the regulations and uh getting things out there so people expect it soon the swing pricing is the most controversial piece of it it's basically uh you know almost like surge pricing with an uber though air if all of a sudden people want to sell and they it's a certain percentage of the fund the they determine the prices are moving by a certain level it's going to be it they'll it will give them the ability to implement penalty pricing and it it's another chance the last round of money fund reforms there are two sets in 2011 2014 that went into effect in 2016 and these emergency gates and fees were the the piece that some say caused problems in in March 2020 and it basically allowed funds to 
put up gates and to stop the withdrawals if things got really intense or to implement liquidity fees. And so swing pricing is another way to implement a liquidity fee. And the, the problem that regulators are trying to solve, and it may be unsolvable is the, you know, at root is, you know, if somebody wants to run and somebody wants to get out, you know, you don't want them to get a different price than the person staying in the portfolio if the price is not a dollar, if there's pressure on it and those outflows, you wanna, so the, the thinking was that we're gonna penalize that investor uh, for moving early, for getting out and try and rebuild the NAV as the money leaves. But it's just, I mean, it's when, when uh, Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt on September 13 or 14 in 2008, I laughed on that Monday when you know the the pros were already up on Sunday. They were they were in the office. Uh, they left the barbecues on Sunday. They were in the office on Monday morning. I was still sleeping uh, blissfully at the time, but uh, you know I laughed at the time. I was like, you know, Lehman Brothers debt. All we know is it's not a hundred cents on the dollar and it's not zero. But pick a number in between. So figuring out in that rush, in that run, when the commercial paper market freezes figuring out what the price is is a uh, very tall task so uh, the hope is you know people expect the swing pricing to be implemented you know one of the SEC commissioners Hester Peirce criticized it when it was proposed and said just because it's subjective and complicated doesn't make it better and I laugh and said oh that means you can make stuff up then it might be workable in that case so uh, we'll see how it's written, how it goes, but it may, it, it's all, suppo supposedly it's only going to apply to prime money funds, which are, as Joseph said, half the size what they were before, and they may be half the size again if this comes to fru fruition. So they went from $2 trillion to $1 trillion. They may be headed towards $500 billion or smaller uh, in, a year from now or whenever the rules go into effect. Um, so we'll see. It's But the, the industry is already heavily weighted towards government and treasury money funds and and I think the SEC may back off and may go with some kind of tiered liquidity fee that's a little more workable but I uh, you know in the past the industry the money fund industry criticized the gates and fees and I'm now like you know be careful about your criticism because if it becomes law and becomes the rule you know you can't say something was the devil and then turn around the next week and say oh it's not so bad yeah. <laughs> so it's like you, you sort of have to target your temper your criticism with the expectation that maybe you got to live with so, it so pete just to be clear is this regulation that the ce sec wants to enforce because it thinks it will make prime money market funds more safe and also how do you think it will implement the profitability of money market funds and does the industry itself do they oppose it do they support it and and what are your views on it yeah i mean they're uh, definitely opposed to the swing pricing the funds that run money market funds and and most of the investors as well uh you know, basically, it's it's going to make things, you know, the, the regulators continue to try to solve this problem of not having the government step in and back things, but uh, it, it's an unsolvable problem. And the crazy thing is, we saw in September 2008 and in March 2020, when the whole world is melting down, when everybody's running, the only thing that works is the Treasury and the Fed stepping in saying, we'll back it all. And so their, their record's 2-0, and oh, and they want to change the starting quarterback. I'm just mystified by, by the whole thing. So just, just to be clear, so swing pricing is like, suppose I put $100 in a prime money market fund, and I expect to get $100 out. But if there's swing pricing and the market conditions change, maybe I can't get $100 out. Maybe I get $98 out. So in a sense, it becomes less like a checking account and more just like an investment like, uh, like Apple, in a sense. Is, is that or like is a that, net something that moves that, that you're going to be a dislocation from the net asset value like if yeah a municipal bond etf in march of 2020 if the the nav net asset value went from 12 dollars to 10 dollars but uh that's what that net asset value the value of the the what it holds but the etf itself the stock could have gone from 12 dollars to uh you know nine dollars and 40 cents so there was a six percent dislocation from net asset value so that's essentially what this would be, but just in a more regulatory, regu uh, regulated form, Pete? Yeah, and and that's, it's, uh, 
very a very rare event where this may happen but the the issue is so sensitive because cash and these transactions are so intertwined that we saw in September 2008 and March 2020 it's like you know that dollar that gets turned into 99 cents or god forbid frozen you know is already supposed to pay this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy and so if you put a halt to the sort of the transactions it's uh you know it's like throwing a a wrench in the engine of the economy so I mean, it's definitely something that uh, there's going to be a lot of, even after the SEC issues the final rules, no matter what they say, you know, there's still going to be some interpretations and back and forth. And then as, as we saw with some of the brokerage sweeps the last time, you know, if, if there's a fear that it could get triggered in this extreme scenario and they're not sure to, how to handle it, some of them are just going to say, forget it, I'm going to use bank deposits for this. So. Uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting to see. So basically, it would make money market funds less money-like in a sense, and le less like a deposit. So uh, you mentioned that uh, in money market fund reform last time, which came into effect 2016, one of the things that they put in place was gates. And so for those of you who don't know, that means that if, uh, let's say, you, you are a prime money market fund and you're experiencing a liquidity problem, perhaps there is some distress in your investments, and rather than have you fire sell those investments to meet investor redemptions, you can just close down the fund and prevent anyone from withdrawing money. Now, that terrified investors because in a sense, sometimes that can be worse than swing, swing pricing. Whereas if you put $100 into a money market fund and there's swing pricing, maybe you can get $98 out. But if there's a gate, then you get nothing else. And that's that's terrifying to a lot of investors. So. Uh, in 2016, as Pete mentioned, you had about a trillion dollars move out of the prime money market funds into the Govy funds because many investors would not find it acceptable to be gated. And perhaps uh, if they do swing pricing, uh, prime money market fund assets will again see a similar flight uh, as Pete suggested. So it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, time in, in the prime money market fund industry. Yeah, I just, I just want to revisit the question of what is something that will break. Again, in 2008, it was the securitized credit market, CDOs that were comp comprised of uh, subprime mortgage-backed securities. In 2019, it was the repo system, which is very interesting because the system had so much more liquidity and bank reserves than it did before the crisis. What do you think uh, will break this time? Do you think something, you know, maybe you think it's, it's possible that something doesn't break at all, which will, will be interesting. Um, but, you know, to be, to be honest, I went to a dinner last night where I was talking to a lot of sort of macro investors and, and plumbing strategists who I'm sure both of you, you know, def definitely know of. Um, and so I'm kind of bared up based on, I'm, I'm pretty bared up based on, on fear, on plumbing. I, I'm listening to about subprime auto loans, uh, collateralized uh, loan obligations, uh, high yield credit. So I guess those are some things that if markets were to break, that would be something that would break. Uh, I guess, you know, a stock market S&P 500 could go limit down like it did in, in March 2020. That's something that could break. But in those scenarios, number one, do you have any insight into which one of those it would be? And number two, in those scenarios, how would the two types of money market funds, government funds, which are four trillion and seem very safe, as well as the much smaller prime uh, uh, money market funds, which uh, are less safe, but but you know still could be safe. How do you think? Ro what role will they play in there, um, Pete? I know that's a it's a pretty labor intensive question, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, sure. You know, uh, I, my first thought is whatever's going to break will be something that nobody expects and nobody is predicting. You know, what people are have been before they haven't been at, as nervous about the prime space because you really need a big European bank, uh, a big bank to go down. And a lot of the banks outside the U.S. are, you know, embedded with their governments as well. They're, you know, national champion types that one would expect the, the government to support. But uh, the, uh, the concerns out there, I, I'd be concerned about, you know, the the T-bill ETFs, the, the things, that, things that are sold as cash, but yet are seeing negatives and and those ultra shorts you know and other things that are they're that showing negative returns right now uh you know i started writing about money funds in 1993 1994 i was yeah. there i didn't know what i was doing some say i still don't uh for for the meltdown then you saw you know 
you had a bond, uh, ultra short bond funds down 30% in that scenario. And so, as I said, it's never the blow up, it's the run that kills you. So those outflows, the, the decline in assets are what really cause small wounds to become critical, to become fatal. And so, you know, you're not, you're down, the ultra short bond funds are down 20% over one year. It's like 20% over one year is not gonna kill you. 20% over one month, over one week, is going to kill you you're not, eventually. You're not talking about the outflow, Out, outflow, right? asset, de asset declines. Yes. And so that's what people, people in the money fund, it's inflow or outflow because the NAV is almost always one. In, in stock and bond fund land, the NAV going down is just as bad as an outflow. People are preoccupied on the flows, but it's the asset levels that are, that the portfolio managers, if he's got to sell, he's got to sell. And it's like, if you don't have the natural liquidity come and do, and then, of course, stablecoin and tether, you know, I don't know that much about, but that's what everybody's sort of watching as well to see are the outflows, are the declines uh, in some of those stable coins causing forced sales. And it's that asset sale, that fire sale that uh, that makes a little loss, you know, something that's that's really painful. And uh, we haven't seen that to date either. But. Yeah, as I said, it's probably going to be something out of left field that uh, nobody knew. Because in in 07, 08, my my, you know, we're we we still should be arguing over what happened. And and my real summary was, it, I compared them to jet airliners. I'm like, these things aren't inherently dangerous. These structured, you know, asset backed securities, all this stuff. I'm like, it worked in the laboratory, but that it was really a it was mortgage related at root, but it was a flight from complexity that all of a sudden people were just like, I don't understand it, sell it. Yeah. And that's that's the risk, the, the enemy is us. It's not these rocket scientists. It's somebody saying, you know what, get me out and sell and not understanding that your actions, you know, are going to have consequences by forcing that portfolio manager to sell when he doesn't want to sell. It's like, you want to be buying bonds now, you don't want to be selling them. Well, you have to and because so it's your job it because people are withdrawing money. Yeah, yeah uh, Pete, I'm glad you brought up stable coins. I, I want uh, to ask both of you about that at the end of this conversation. But for now, uh, let's talk about those short term bond funds. Uh, the, the one to three year treasury bond ETF that I know is SHY, uh, S-H-Y is its ticker. What are you seeing there in terms of outflows? People are withdrawing money. Um, and then also, I don't know, you, I, I, I'm sure you do uh, track much more sh shorter term duration uh, stuff that's shorter duration than one year. And also, I just want to clarify that when you say short duration, you're not saying someone is shorting long term bonds. You mean people are buying short duration stuff? That's a, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. The, the, you know, one to three year, one year, you know, money funds are normally one year and in just beyond that, the ultra short, short term stuff. And yeah, I don't know what the, the assets uh, of shy in particular have been, but they can't be up. Everything's down and everything's just the, the you know, the what it scares me when when I'm, I'm such a contrarian, I drive my uh, wife and kids crazy uh, arguing about anything, but I'm Whenever everybody likes something, I don't. So I'm like, you know, the two-year treasury bill, everyone's like, two-year treasury, who could argue with that? It's 4%, it's awesome. I'm like, there's always a reason why it's 4%. I'm like, because if money funds are gonna be 5% as we get into next year, you just lost money. You're underwater in a two-year treasury bill. So it's like, if you got a house, you're buying a house in two years, knock yourself out. It looks great. You know, it's certainly, if, if it's used properly, you know, that's a nice yield you should be adding if you can. But it, those no-brainers like that, I'm like, you know, these uh, that we saw in 07, before the 08 uh, catastrophe, that the ultra-short bond funds there, there was a Barron's article in November, uh, 07 about a GE ultra short and there's Columbia which the, used to be affiliated with Bank of America had a this strat cash this enhanced cash thing this monster was 40 60 billion and then all of a sudden the uh, Kuwait Investment Authority wanted to sell half of it and it's like pfft, <laughs> you know, they gave them the securities. It's like, we're not going to sell it. We won't do that to you, but we're going to give you the securities in kind. So if you want to shoot yourself in the leg <laughs> and sell all this stuff now, you can do it. But uh, no, it's, it, it's, and even the, even the things that appeared to be 
tragedies and and painful things it's like this SPAC now come and do a lot of the commentators make the point that you actually made money because you didn't lose money and so I joke with reserve fund you know you you ended up frozen there for a while but having your money frozen you know you never want that to happen it sucks but sometimes that's the best thing that ever happened to you because you couldn't do something dumb and sell it Right. So, Peter, when you say the two year is risky, do, do you think that if the Fed hikes by more than is currently priced into the curve, people will lose money there? And, and then, Joseph, I want to bring you into the conversation. Yeah. And I didn't say risky, yeah. but that, that it's being it's probably being used improperly by a lot of people that they think, oh, it's fully I could sell a Treasury bill. It's guaranteed by the U.S. Yep. government. It's like, no, no, the U.S. government not going to guarantee it tomorrow. It's going to guarantee you in two years from now when you need the money. If you need the money in the meantime, it's like CDs and, and other things. It, it, it's like these inflation-linked bonds that I'm like, my God, what are you doing with these financial writers recommending this complex stuff? I'm like, you know, if you have to sell it, you're, you might lose money. And it's like, well, how can you, you don't call that cash. You just should, you know, you can do that, but just understand, you know, make sure that you've got other sources of cash in the meantime so that you're not forced into a corner you know and like a lot of people in the stock market are undoubtedly doing they're you know they're leveraged too much they're just not unwilling to ride out the the damage and that's what uh, that's what causes you know causes real pain joseph i, I, I think i'll jump in and actually help people understand a little bit about this run dynamic that pete's been talking about in case they're not as familiar with it so for example if you put a hundred dollars in an investment fund that investment fund takes that money and invests it in securities. Let's say the two-year in this example, it's a short-term fund. Uh, however, what if you want to redeem cash out of that fund? What happens then is that the investor, the investment fund goes and it sells those two years to get cash to give to you. And as Pete suggested, sometimes there's not a lot of liquidity in the markets. So what happens if you redeem your shares, but there's not a lot of liquidity? then that fund has to go and sell that asset, maybe take a loss, and then to get to get your money back. And if other investors see that there are big losses in their net asset value, maybe they're all go to redeem as well. And so you could have a very, uh, like a fire sale dynamic, like a run, like a bank run basically, and yeah. what is uh, essentially a shadow bank. So that that's that, that's definitely a risk. And we saw that happen in March 2020 too with many, many, um, many mutual funds. And these are very remote risks, yes. but I'm just, yeah. the point is, you know, with your cash, you know, don't get greedy. Don't go for, you know, earning an extra few basis points, an extra half a percent or something, uh, you know, it really doesn't, isn't going to matter in the long run if, you know, if your wife's going to criticize you for almost losing your money <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. Right. And to be clear, like shy, this ETF, it went from a peak of about 86 bucks to now 81 bucks. So th there's definitely risk there, but that's a level of volatility that you might see in the stock market in a single day. So it is still much, much lower volatility. Yeah, minor. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the risk is if there's institutions that count on it to have no volatility, volatility at all, and they levered it up, that could have a lot of uh, 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 risk for sure. Joseph, uh, before we move on to stable coins, do you, have any, do you have any thoughts about what could break? Well, my, Jack, my, my view, as I've been saying on this show for, for a number of months, has always been that, that there's tremendous risk in the treasury market. And that just has to do with two things. One is supply and demand of treasuries, and the other is very poor treasury market liquidity. So on the supply side, as I've been noting, you have tremendous deficits and you have QT. So the amount of issuance the market has to digest is exceptionally high going forward. From the demand side, um, you know, in the past it was the Fed and the banks that are buying. Now we have to find a new marginal buyer. I'll, I'll add one more thing to that actually. So the amount of supply in treasuries is high, but the amount of supply in global sovereign debt is also tremendous. Um, if you see what's happening in the UK, you have uh, the Prime Minister Truss, Truss basically suggesting that, you know, she's just going to uh, cap everyone's electricity bills. What, where is the money going to come from? They're just going to issue issue gilts. A uh, similar thing happening in a continental Europe as well. And so that that's a tremendous amount of global sovereign debt issuance. Someone has to buy that. They might need higher yields, lower prices. And at a time 
when market liquidity is low, you could have something that is very nonlinear. Now, I was on the I was at the Fed when I saw the repo market spike from about 2% to 9% intraday. And for those of you who don't know, the repo market is much, much more liquid than the cash treasury market. So if it can happen to repo, uh, that, in my view, greatly expands the possibilities as to how high a break in yields could suddenly happen if it does emerge. So that's what I watch out for. And um, we see, in, some, I, in my view, we see instability in the treasury market right now. Today, we're up almost 20 basis points. The move index, invention of, of Harley Bassman, which we've had on the show mm -hmm. before as well, is also historically high. So it does seem like there's some fragility there. And if something does break, I imagine that everyone is going to pour into a money market fund. So I think we're going to see a, <laughs> a huge surge in money market fund assets, perhaps, if this does happen. Uh, Joseph, any did people talk about treasury market as the deepest, most liquid capital market in the world? Do you think that's kind of an overrated reputation? In the sovereign debt space, it is the deepest and most liquid market. So it's about $600 billion a day in cash transactions. And the problem is that even though it's still deep and liquid, uh, the amount of outstanding continues to grow at a much faster pace than the underlying cash market is growing. So, you know, even if you have a deep and liquid market, if the U.S. Treasury is issuing, let's say, almost a trillion every year, uh, y you have to have the cash market scale appropriately to maintain that relative liquidity, but it's not scaling in the same way, not even close. Uh, with regard to, let's say, futures and off the runs, so, you know, the on the runs are, so for those of you who don't know, on the run treasuries are the treasuries that are most recently issued, and off the runs are those that, that were issued in the past. And there's tremendous Ill illiquidity in the off the runs, so that's a concern. Futures are exchange traded, so they're very liquid. Oftentimes what happens if you want to have exposure to treasuries um, and there's illiquidity, what you could do is you could transact in the futures market. There is a disconnect sometimes between futures and the futures markets and the cash market, but you have a whole bunch of investment funds who are that difference. So usually it's not, uh, like, it's not super wide. Final topic I want to ask you about is stable coins. Uh, it sort of... Uh, basically money on the blockchain where you can earn yield, and it runs a huge spectrum from some, a product that is actually audited, and you, know, you can prove that they actually own treasuries, and it's essentially a money market fund uh, on the blockchain that apparently has as much legitimacy and safety as um, you, you know, a money market fund. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see about that. Uh, Peter, I want, I want to hear your thoughts. And then that runs the spectrum to... Uh, uh, funds that are not audited and say they have the amount of money, they have an asset to liability match, and you sort of just have to take their faith on it. And then on the other side, all the way on the other side, it's like they admit that they're not backed by anything at all, but you just have to you trust them uh, with the, because the algorithm is so good. So yeah, uh, Pete, what, what are your thoughts on, on this, on stablecoins? Yeah, I mean, I only know what uh, I've been reading, and the, the disclosures on the collateral just are still you know, extremely thin and sporadic. I mean, money funds protested when they were forced to disclose monthly portfolio holdings back in 2011 and 2016. But, you know, five days after the month end, you see what your fund owns. And, and that's, you know, I joke transparency isn't all it's cracked up to be either because all of a sudden, if you own something that's kryptonite, you know, that could cause a problem versus uh, whatever. True. But... You know, do you have the the collateral? Do you have the wherewithal to back? You know, any kind of uh, substantial request for redemptions. You know, is the overarching, overriding question. A lot of that is what investments you show underneath, but a lot of that is history, is the organization, and you know, a lot of these just Bermuda domiciles just don't bring comfort uh, to a lot of people. So. You know, and you saw the, the Terra Luna event really just kick this off. And so it, it's a worry, you know, worrisome issue. Uh, it's withstood a lot of scrutiny and a lot of blows, though. So you look at it and say, you know, it can't be all that fragile because it should have crumbled by now uh, if there were something uh, wrong. But it's just something that other players in the market are keeping their eye on because all of a sudden, if somebody gets a run, they've got to liquidate and fire sale, and they might take down collateral damage. They might take down some other players 
with them if they own you know and we don't know this but if it's chinese commercial paper you know it's like there's nothing wrong with some chinese commercial paper if it's china construction bank or some of the big four chinese banks they're some of the best credits in the world but if it's something that you don't know what it is that's commercial paper itself is not really well defined and well regulated and a lot of these things are in gaps between U.S. European regulators, you know, they're not sure, we don't know if it's the SEC, the CFTC, you know, the ESMA in Europe, or, or nobody that's, that's responsible for various facets. So, you know, it's just something that, uh, that's been a concern and that, uh, you know, jur journalists have been poking away at. They're probably jealous of the whole uh, <laughs> crypto wealth creation and, and are trying to find something wrong like they always are. But uh, God bless them. So I don't hold that much hope for stablecoin. But certain, there, are, there are now blockchain money funds. And I see, you do see, you know, hybrid uh, uh, works that are out there that you, at some point, you know, having a you know, a USD digital currency, you know, may, may be the answer or having a, an option just for, for transactional purposes, uh, you know, they've proven themselves to be very worthwhile. And so, you know, you, you can't argue with the, uh, you know, uh, once you get to be a couple hundred billion dollars, you're sort of on the cusp of you know, whether you're going to become a real big asset class or not. I, when people ask me about various segments of the money market and I have no idea how big it is, I guess I'm like 300 billion. I'm like any bigger, someone would track it, any smaller and no one would care. <laughs> Uh, nice. nice. For my final question, uh, Joseph, it is about something Powell said in the presser yesterday on the 21st of September, which was he was asked, are you contemplating selling mortgage-backed securities? And he said, not at this time and not in the near future. And it, to me, I interpret it as code for essentially never unless something big happens. Uh, how did you interpret it and, and what, do you, uh, what significance do you think it has? I agree with you, Jack, that so central bankers never say never, you know, you never want to box yourself in. You always want to leave yourself a way out. Maybe something changes in the future. Uh, but that sounded pretty strongly like, no, I'm not going to do that. And for good reason, too. So one, if you look at the spread between mortgage securities and treasuries, they're very wide. There's really no reason for them for the Fed to continue to try to widen them out. Uh, the second thing is that, well, you have housing markets sowing very, very rapidly right now. So if the housing market is already slowing and we know monetary policy usually acts with a lag, there's no reason to add fuel to that fire right now. It's good to have that option that maybe sometime in the future, if for whatever reason we think that monthly market is still too hot, we can sell mortgage-backed securities. But at the moment, everything seems to be working as it should. Very interesting. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, Joseph, you, the former senior trader at the New York Fed. People can find your writings at fedguy.com. Your book, Central Banking 101, is a must read. Uh, and you're on Twitter, people can find you at fedguy12. Uh, Peter, people should definitely check out uh, your service, Money Fund Intelligence, as well as uh, Crane Data. Um, people can find you on Twitter, uh, uh, Pete, at Crane Data. That's at Crane Data on Twitter. And I also understand you're having a series of money fund symposiums. I know you're having one very soon in Europe, uh, like next week. I actually think by the time people, by the time this airs, it could be late for people to, to buy tickets, unfortunately. But then you also have one uh, on December 17th, and excuse me, December 15th and 16th. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that uh, conference. Yeah, I just run a uh, series of conferences, mainly for money fund professionals, big cash investors that issuers, big banks that sell to money funds and stuff. But uh, yeah, thrilled to be back in person. It's been a, uh, the virtual is awesome, but uh, you know, I don't drink anymore, but there's nothing like watching drunk people up close uh, again. So <laughs> yeah, It's a great conference. We at the New York Fed used to go as well. So if you guys are in the space or interested, definitely check it out. Oh, thank you. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, thanks again, um, you guys, and thanks everyone for watching. Take care. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Really appreciate it.
there is something that you need to be doing right now, and that is reading the BlockWorks Daily Newsletter. For top market insights and the latest in crypto news, you have to subscribe to the BlockWorks Daily Newsletter, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to this video or by visiting blockworks.co forward slash newsletter.